Ladies and gentlemen, may I first issue each of you a welcome and the compliments uh, of the Institute at our first NZIIA occasion for 2019. I chaired the first meeting of our standing committee yesterday afternoon and can advise that the filled agenda exhibited great promise for the year ahead of us, here in Wellington certainly, but also in other places in New Zealand. Years that end with the figure nine exhibit examples of anniversaries of such things as the lowering of the Berlin Wall and the arrival of the modern era for the People's Republic of China. For a civil society organisation which aims to provide insights uh, into international affairs, there is thus good prospect in having speakers address us later in the year, particularly on what is being called the Pacific Reset, the policy being applied by New Zealand's foreign policy and much more. But what causes this room to be so pleasingly filled uh, and for a waiting list to have had to be applied is the engagement we are about to listen to this evening, that of Professor Richard Whitman, Professor of Politics and International Relations at the University of Kent in the United Kingdom, and an acknowledged leading commentator on Brexit uh, and British politics. Professor Whitman is also a visiting fellow at Chatham House, the mother or maybe father of all institutes of international affairs in many parts of the world. I could go on, but will not trespass on whatever time uh, with which you may like to engage us, Professor and it is my delight in a moment to ask you to address us. I'm advised that the professor wishes to speak for about 40 minutes, after which there will be ample opportunity uh, for questions and comments to be solicited uh, from all of you, for which we have ro roving microphones and people willing to engage them. May I ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Whitman warmly to our city of Wellington. Thank you, folks. Uh, it's great to be here, and thank you for laying on such fantastic weather. Uh, we, uh, we got your Prime Minister, you got me, uh, so I don't know who gets the best end of the deal. It could have been worse, you could have got my Prime Minister. <laughs> anyway, um, what I want to do uh, this evening is to, uh, to, uh, to have a conversation, if I may, about Brexit and, and where we are with Brexit. Uh, Brexit has been something of a preoccupation uh, for me since uh, the beginning of 2016, where uh, I was taken off my day job to be involved in the referendum uh, as, a, as a neutral uh, supplier of facts to broadcasters and to the public uh, and so on in the hope that we would have an enlightened referendum. So you can see that uh, my track record in engagement on Brexit issues is not first class. Um, but what I want to do uh, this evening is, is to sort of talk us through uh, not the detail of the campaign, uh, which of course is controversial, uh, and uh, there are still ongoing controversies around the, rec uh, the referendum campaign itself, uh, connected to both the quality of the debate, uh, uh, the, uh, the lies uh, that were told or not in the course of the campaign, and also the whole issue as to whether there was any external uh, influence uh, on the referendum. I'll steer clear of those issues, although we could take those up in discussion. What I want to talk about really is, is uh, where we're at on the basis of the decision that the, the British uh, public made in the 23rd of June uh, referendum. 
uh, on a fairly straightforward question, which is, should the, did you want the UK to remain or to leave uh, the European Union? Uh, and on a pretty high turnout, uh, by uh, British uh, electoral uh, standards, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a result which, depending on your point of view, was either uh, a clincher and therefore meant that the UK was going to leave uh, on conditions that were to be determined by the government, or was sufficiently close uh, that uh, perhaps there is the need uh, for a second uh, referendum. And that's an issue that I'm sure we will get back to later on uh, in the course of this evening. But perhaps it's worth thinking for a moment as to why we got the, the Brexit result uh, that we did. And, and an awful lot of work uh, has been done to try and understand the Brexit referendum result. The reason why uh, we got the referendum in the first place was, of course, because of a civil war within the Conservative Party. Uh, and a civil war uh, that is now in its third decade uh, and looks uh, as if it has no signs uh, of abating. And that, of course, is what drove Prime Minister David Cameron to hold the referendum to try and settle the question within his own party, but also because of anxiety that the UK Conservative Party was being outflanked by uh, the UK Independence Party. But what we also know from analysis uh, of voters is that the drivers uh, for those who voted to leave were essentially questions around identity and identity anxiety, worries about being governed uh, by uh, Brussels, and also a feeling of alienation from uh, public life uh, and uh, disadvantage within uh, Britain's economy uh, and real worries about uh, immigration uh, and migration. Uh, and all of those, uh, uh, it's quite clear, have not disappeared from British uh, public life and have not disappeared uh, in the course of the debate uh, that we've had since we had the referendum in, uh, in June uh, 2016. Uh, and of course, one of the, the consequences, or rather one of the central aspects of Brexit, uh, has been the psychodrama that is uh, the uh, Conservative Party. Uh, and the Conservative Party's uh, need to deal with itself in terms of the Europe uh, uh, question. We've lost uh, Prime Minister David Cameron, who called a referendum uh, that he expected to win, uh, called a referendum without making uh, uh, or providing any direction, clear direction to government that it should prepare itself in case of a leave vote. Um, and obviously after the referendum uh, result by resignation, he also then triggered uh, a leadership uh, contest within the Conservative Party, uh, which ended up being a very truncated uh, leadership contest and one in which uh, Theresa May uh, was elected not with a ballot of the membership, um, but by uh, the decision uh, of her opponents within that contest uh, to withdraw. So she, she was not tested uh, as uh, Prime Minister uh, during that contest. But within that contest itself and within the immediate aftermath of the Brexit vote, really the tone was set for much of the Brexit discussion that we've had subsequently within the UK, which has essentially been uh, for uh, the Prime Minister to try and manage for herself uh, the response uh, of her party and therefore the response of the government to the Brexit result. Uh, and uh, Theresa May uh, has acted, I think, with single-mindedness in terms of her vision as to what Brexit constitutes, uh, and therefore uh, she has sought to sort of direct the Brexit process as one which hasn't really been uh, intended to have a sort of wide-ranging public debate, a cross-party debate, or even an extensive public debate as to what the alternatives to, to membership, uh, membership are. Um, but having made the decision to, uh, to trigger the vote to leave, and then having the public then having voted, the British government decided to invoke so-called Article 50, uh, that we'll come back to in a moment, and to engage in what is a very unusual process in international negotiations, which is to simultaneously uh, negotiate with the organization that it intends to leave, at the same time remembering, uh, remaining a member of that organization and continuing to participate uh, in the work uh, of that organization. And that's a pretty uh, unusual thing. It's also been a learning process for the UK because what the UK ha has discovered uh, 
uh, since it embarked on those, those negotiations, is actually it's really difficult to negotiate with the EU as a third party. Now, many, I think, of the, the structural problems of Brexit and where we've ended up with Brexit hang on Article 50, this article within the Treaty on European Union that has provision for a country being able uh, to exit uh, the EU. And for those of you who, have, uh, who have, haven't taken a look at it, it's perhaps surprising that it's so short in terms of what it deals with, bearing in mind that these five parts within Article 50 are intended to deal with the unwinding of a relationship between uh, the European Union and a member state which has been integrated economically, politically uh, and socially uh, with a project since the early 1970s. The article was not written with the UK in mind, of course. It was written uh, with uh, the idea in mind that a country should be able to leave uh, the European Union uh, as a political uh, organisation. But there are a number of traps within this article which have become apparent. One is that uh, once you trigger the process, you take the decision to trigger the process, and you start a clock running uh, that runs for a two-year period from when you trigger that process. And that's why we are now in the situation that we are, where we're looking at the potential for the UK leaving the EU uh, on the 29th of March, without necessarily having uh, completed uh, the ratification of a withdrawal agreement with uh, the European Union. Secondly, that the agreement, uh, the Article 50 is primarily concerned with the issues of untangling the relationship, not about building a future relationship. So uh, if, you, if you take a look at uh, the articles here, you'll see that they are concerned with a mechanism of how you deal with withdrawal rather than having a great elaboration on how you deal with putting yourself back together again in a new status type uh, relationship. Two other things it's worth considering uh, on Article 50. One is the possibility to extend the Article 50 negotiation process, which was uh, a kind of an issue that was of interest to train spotters, but now is a live political issue. Can you, ex can you extend that period uh, of Article 50 negotiation? And as you see from the article, that's done on the basis of unanimous agreement on the part of all the other member states. So uh, that is a significant hurdle to overcome, particularly if you've behaved badly or seem to have behaved badly within the negotiation process. But also uh, that uh, if you really want to, you can decide to rejoin the European Union, but you rejoin the European Union on an entirely different basis. You rejoin as a new member and you negotiate a new member. One of the issues that's been adjudicated on since uh, Article 50 was put in place and since the UK triggered the Article 50 process uh, was whether you can withdraw your application once you have decided to leave. And it's clear that you can, but you can't do it for tactical reasons. Basically, if you're going to withdraw your Article 50 letter, you can do so, but you do so because you're serious about remaining. That's a low probability event, I would suggest. But somebody in here may disagree. And if you do, we'll take that at the end. And if we really disagree, I've got some boxing gloves in here and we get a Brexit fight club. <laughs> anyway, uh, the Article 50 negotiating process uh, itself... Yeah? Are you? Is that better? I'm softly spoken and I don't carry a big stick. Um, <laughs> The Article 50 uh, negotiating process has, a, has this series of stages uh, which require an agreement to be reached and then the agreement to be ratified that doesn't have to be approved by all member states. Uh, and then the European Parliament gets its say on, uh, on the uh, terms of the withdrawal agreement as they stand. I thought that by this moment in time that we would have got through the process of uh, agreeing the withdrawal agreement and that we would have been well advanced in the ratification process and possibly talking about the future relationship. Um, but clearly uh, events uh, have intervened. And events have intervened, which is a whole series of factors which have made Brexit perhaps uh, a mission impossible, certainly made it extremely difficult uh, to uh, deliver on. And what I want to do uh, in the time I have remaining uh, 
is, is to talk through those difficulties uh, and why uh, we've ended up in the situation that we have um, where Brexit uh, is still uh, somewhat uh, up in the air, which is classic British understatement. Now, the decision to invoke uh, Article 50, to take the decision to write the letter, to advise the European Union that the UK was going to leave, was initially a decision that was taken by the Prime Minister and advisers with the consent of her government, and then subsequently uh, there was a case that was taken to the UK Supreme Court that required Parliament uh, to uh, also agree to that decision, which Parliament did. So Parliament, the UK Parliament, has previously taken the decision that the UK would leave uh, the EU. Um, as we'll see, there's been a bit of backpedalling uh, since that uh, on the part of some parliamentarians, partly because perhaps the consequences of triggering Article 50 were not fully uh, understood, uh, but we'll get to that in a moment. But it's also worth considering what the UK had to do to embark on the negotiations themselves. And many of you uh, will be familiar with working in an organisation in which maybe you change the IT, you change the hardware, yeah? uh, when you want to improve your setup. Or you change the software because you want to enhance the way that you work. The UK, to negotiate Brexit, decided to make a hardware change and to make a software change whilst writing the software. Now, that is not a recipe for success in pursuing any public policy, and it's not a recipe for success with negotiating with uh, a third party. So what the UK decided to do was to retain the sort of classic British system in the area of foreign policy, which is essentially put the Prime Minister at the core of uh, decision making and decision taking uh, and bringing uh, on board uh, the cabinet or seeking to bring on board the cabinet with her and try and keep parliament and the public at arm's length uh, essentially. What the prime minister has found is that she's not had the freedom to pursue the policy, policy that she wants with her cabinet and has had to deal with cabinet uh, resignations uh, she's lost 10 cabinet ministers, two secretaries of state, which is another one of the records that she's broken. Um, but she's also had to contend with a divided parliamentary party, the breakdown of party discipline, uh, in that the normal means of controlling the parliamentary party, offering preferment, using the whips, uh, and so on to keep members of parliament in line, are broken down. Um, and uh, she's also faced a media environment which has been uh, less uh, than supportive. And to compound all of those problems, she obviously took the decision to hold a, uh, another general election in 2017, intended to consolidate and strengthen her position for uh, a, uh, uh, the Brexit that she wanted, ended up losing her majority uh, and having to rely uh, on an agreement uh, of uh, consent and supply with the Democratic uh, Unionist uh, Party. So um, she has made life probably as difficult for herself uh, as any politician uh, could have done. So it's all the more remarkable, I would suggest, that, that the government has actually got to a position in which it's been able to agree a withdrawal uh, agreement uh, with uh, the EU. And this, this re-engineering, this, this, uh, this hardware that the British government has had to put in place, is to construct a mechanism to administer and to conduct the negotiations, a set of negotiations which are more complicated than any British government has undertaken within recent, uh, uh, recent memory. And it's done it essentially by pulling bits of government or pulling parts of the civil service apart and putting them together in quite different ways. So instead of giving the job uh, of negotiating with the EU to uh, our foreign office, foreign and commonwealth office, uh, or to our Department of International Trade, because we didn't have one, because of course our trade policy has been pursued with the European Union or through the European Union since succession to the EU, the government decided to create two new departments, the Department for Exiting the EU called DEXEU, which perhaps sounds like a laxative, <laughs> uh, and also the department called DIT, Department for International Trade, which has the role uh, of developing a nascent uh, 
uh, trade policy uh, for, uh, for the UK. Uh, but the Foreign and Commonwealth Office has largely been uh, sidelined uh, in uh, the process of those negotiations, which is unfortunate because that's one of the ministries which has had the greatest body of expertise in European uh, Union engagement. The other two bodies, which it's important for us to think about at this stage in terms of uh, organisations which will take on, I think, more importance over the next few weeks in Brexit. One is Parliament, as we're already seeing, whether Parliament itself uh, wishes to take on more responsibility and powers, which have been traditionally the case for uh, Parliament in an area of uh, major public policy but also the devolved administrations in the British Overseas Territories. Uh, and I'll come back to this point a little bit later, but Britain is in effect a, a federal state without a federal constitution. We have a devolution of political power to Northern Ireland, uh, Scotland, uh, and Wales, uh, and with quite different voting profiles for Scotland uh, and for Northern Ireland in the Brexit referendum. But we don't have the plumbing that allows the views of those constituents uh, administrations to actually be taken on board within the process of forming and forging uh, government uh, position, uh, uh, negotiating position uh, on Brexit. So we constructed uh, a machine uh, that looks absolutely perfectly tailored to the job in hand. We need to negotiate with the EU, we need civil servants to do so. Uh, we also need a Department for International Trade to start to get a trade policy up and running uh, for, uh, for the UK. Um, but that hasn't been the problem. The problem essentially has been the software problem, that the government has sought to write the software as to what it wants for Brexit, what it wants to achieve in the negotiations as it's gone along. Uh, and that's because, of course, the Prime Minister has faced the problem of managing her own party, uh, and more recently, since 2017, managing the fact that she does not have a majority uh, in Parliament uh, that she can call on uh, without uh, her partners from the Democratic Unionist Party. And by the way, she's also been fighting an on-off leadership uh, contest uh, within her own party, uh, both uh, through those who have been in government and out of government, such as our former Foreign Minister Boris Johnson, uh, but also through vote of confidence uh, in her from her members of parliament, potential trigger for a leadership contest, uh, which uh, she managed uh, to survive. Uh, and uh, the leadership contest itself, I think, is, is probably fair to say is in hibernation uh, rather than uh, finished. Uh, and we're likely to see that uh, erupt uh, uh, any time soon. So I've mentioned the, the software or the idea of the software. One of the things that's made the negotiations incredibly difficult in terms of what the outcomes might be are the British government's red lines, or so-called red lines. And these are a series of areas in which the government has made clear, both through government statements, speeches, and published documents, uh, as to how it envisages its future relationship with the EU, which is to leave the single market, to no longer be under the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, the EU's uh, Supreme Court, if you like, to end the freedom of movement, which exists by being an EU member, to leave the customs union, which means to take on a trade, independent trade policy for the UK, but at the same time, whilst doing all of those things, also to ensure that there's no Ireland uh, on the island uh, of Ireland, to make sure that you take account of citizenship rights, uh, both for EU citizens in the UK, who are not uh, UK nationals. I am at the moment still a UK and an EU citizen for a few more days. Um, and uh, at the same time, to take account of British citizens who are resident uh, in other EU member states. And crucially, to pay, or not to pay, rather, uh, into uh, the EU budget and to not be entangled in the EU's uh, common uh, fisheries policy or common uh, agricultural policy. All of those are perfectly defensible and sensible positions to adopt based on an interpretation of the referendum result uh, which the government has made, which is all of those things are unacceptable to the British people. The problem with having stated those red lines 
and we stated them publicly and reiterated those red lines, is that it limits what can be negotiated with the EU uh, and, uh, and uh, for what uh, purpose. But alongside that, uh, the government um, has to negotiate other things to make Brexit work. There's this legal separation from the EU, which is Article 50. There's a transition period, which is within the withdrawal agreement, because it's transition to what the future relationship is going to look like, the thing which is still indeterminate and won't be determined until after the UK leaves the EU. Also to work out how it's going to cooperate with the EU on issues such as foreign security and defence policy and uh, internal uh, security. But alongside that, and I think of interest to this audience, is how the UK relates to third countries, both in terms of the scheduled negotiations with the WTO, and I think the UK and the EU have disappointed New Zealand on those so far, so my apologies, um, but also uh, the broader uh, framework of agreements that the EU has uh, with third countries, uh, the FTA and other agreements, which the UK leaves uh, when it leaves the European Union. So it has to have those uh, in place, uh, and that is a key challenge and why that Department for International Trade was uh, constructed uh, for the purpose uh, of uh, or creating a new British uh, trade uh, policy. Now, the negotiations uh, themselves, I think it's probably uh, fair to say, have seen the UK uh, isolated, and seen the UK isolated because the European Union also has its own red lines, which is essentially not to alter anything that the European Union does, to accommodate what the UK wants. And that's a defensible position on the part of the EU because it doesn't want to alter how the single market operates, it doesn't want to operate the EU's legal order, uh, and it would rather not um, change the way that it raises uh, money. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, the European Union has, uh, I think, exercised tremendous discipline uh, in terms of the way that the member states have done, partly by constructing for themselves a cutout, as I believe you call it, uh, in murders, in other words, something between you and the person who actually carries out the crime, uh, by having Mr Barnier uh, as the negotiator and being able to stand behind Mr Barnier as the EU's negotiator and to be a very effective uh, negotiator uh, for the uh, European Union, but also tremendous discipline on the part of the, uh, the other 27 member states, message discipline in terms of what they want, and also the inability of uh, British diplomacy to fight its best efforts to try and um, put some light between individual uh, uh, EU uh, member states uh, to the UK's advantage uh, within uh, those uh, negotiations. And the structure of the negotiations themselves, which is something that Britain uh, had uh, hoped uh, to organise in a way that was uh, to its advantage, have also ended up uh, going uh, or being structured in the manner that the EU preferred, which was in its first phase to deal with a whole set of issues that were the key issues for the EU, which was on citizens, on finan financial settlement, and the issue on Northern Ireland. And this understanding, which was reached in December 27, uh, 2017, is really at the heart of the problems that now exist in the Brexit process, because the EU believes, and I think it's fair to say most independent observers would suggest that the UK signed up to the idea of the, bra the, the backstop for Northern Ireland in the manner in which it eventually found its way into uh, the withdrawal agreement. And the UK did that so it could unlock the next phase of the negotiations, which were to allow for discussions on a so-called transition phase, to allow a period between leaving and a new agreement starting because the timescales were insufficient to get a new agreement in place but also to start to talk about the future relationship between the EU and the UK, which you'll remember from Article 50, Article 50 was, was not overly concerned uh, with, the, uh, with the future uh, relationship. So we've been stuck in the phase two phase of the negotiations for quite some time, uh, and we haven't yet really moved into the ratification phase because the British Parliament, although the EU and the UK have agreed on the text, uh, the UK Parliament has not yet uh, approved uh, that uh, text. But what we do have is the withdrawal agreement and we have a political declaration, and I'll talk about those uh, in a moment, if I may. 
Now, this slide is sponsored by Specsavers. Uh, so uh, I apologize, but uh, the reason I've done this is because I wanted to put within this the, the Brexit uh, negotiating complexity. Uh, and the, the lecture is being recorded, and you could take a look at the slide after uh, uh, and, and prove that you really don't need to go uh, to the opticians. Um, but essentially, the point I want to make from all of this verbiage is that the British government's red lines had to be adjusted in the course of the negotiations. They had to be adjusted or revised um, because, um, uh, not just because the, uh, the EU was a good negotiator, and it is uh, a good negotiator with third countries, but also because the red lines could only be blurred a little bit if you were to find a way forward in most of the areas that it was necessary to find a way forward on. And I'm happy to talk through uh, each of uh, these areas, but I want to just focus uh, on two for the moment, if I may. One is Northern Ireland uh, and the so-called backstop, which is that the British government agreed that if you can't reach an agreement between the UK and the EU on the future relationship, so after the UK is withdrawn, you have negotiations about the future relationship, but you cannot reach agreement. There is the ultimate insurance policy in place, which is the UK will remain in a customs union with the EU, and that Northern Ireland will comply with relevant single market legislation to allow you not to have a border on the island of Ireland to uh, address the fact that you have uh, two territories which are actually covered by uh, two different trade sets of training arrangements. On the one hand, the UK single market, and on the other, the EU single market. That's what the, the, Brexit, uh, the, the Northern Ireland backstop is. It is the ultimate uh, insurance policy. But here's the rub, and this is where the EU was a bit cheeky. The EU said you can't talk about the future relationship until you leave. But actually, the Brexit backstop is about the future relationship if you don't do a deal, which is one of the reasons why uh, Tory members of Parliament are so exercised by uh, the backstop. The, the other issue to bear in mind, again, for this uh, audience, is that for a transition process of period that was agreed, the UK leaves the EU on the terms of its withdrawal agreement at the end of March 2019. But for the period until the end of 2020, it in effect remains within the EU, but outside its institutions. And that means for third countries, the terms on which you are intended to trade with the EU, assuming you accept that, are on the same terms as you trade with the EU now. What changes is the end of the transition period, which could be pulled out to 2022. Right? So, Things may change, but they may not. The withdrawal agreement uh, is worth taking a look at for what it covers. The withdrawal agreement is basically about tidying up the detachment of the UK from the EU. Okay? It's not about the future relationship at all. It's all about tidying up or ending the relationship and how you end that relationship. Uh, and how you govern the transition process, how the transition process works. How can you have a country that's in the EU but not in the EU? How can you have an undead member of the EU? In effect, how is that going to, how is that going to work? And so the withdrawal agreement is all about avoiding what we used to call a cliff edge Brexit. Cliff edge Brexit sounded terrible. Now that isn't bad enough to describe the situation the UK is in. Um, by creating legal continuity, legal certainty, uh, certainty for people within the EU and outside, provides for this transition process. It's what I would call a hokey-cokey agreement. Do people in New Zealand dance the hokey-cokey? Fantastic. I, I said this to a continental European audience and they stared back at me. So it's good to be, it's good to be in the Anglosphere. Um, so you know the hokey-cokey. You know, you put your leg in and your leg out. You put your arm in and your arm out, and then you get to shake it all about. That's what the withdrawal agreement is, because the UK remains in, right? It's in the single market, it's in the customs union, continues to pay, 
see if it's a member state, but it's out of the EU institutions. So it doesn't play a role in decision making. But at the same time, it's allowed a little bit of shake it all about. It's allowed to start talking to third countries about the post-UK uh, exit trade deals. So it's given, a bit of, it's given a bit of wiggle room. But the withdrawal agreement also includes the backstop. So you have to accept the backstop, the backstop for Northern Ireland, um, if you're going to accept the withdrawal agreement. And alongside that, we have a political declaration that talks about the future relationship, uh, talks about where, what the ambitions are for both the EU and the UK. And that basically reflects the UK government's red lines, which is that the UK seeks to, and the EU has accepted, that the ambition for both sides is to enter into a comprehensive free trade uh, agreement. Uh, what we sometimes call a Canada or, or Korea deal, Canada Plus, some people talk about, we'll come back to those uh, in a mo. Um, and it also talks about how you replace the backstop. If you can find a better way of making the backstop work, then you can replace it. Um, and it's also possible before the end of the transition process to negotiate a new relationship in the security uh, area as well. And I'm, I'm happy to talk about that in a Q&A. But what it means is that the UK will be moving from a full member position to a very, very different kind of relationship. This is a slide that was produced by Mr Barnier's team and is probably the best example we've had in the modern era of diplomatic trolling, right? <laughs> because what it does is it points out on the basis of the decisions that you have taken in your negotiating position, this is what you are letting yourself in for. So if you want to leave, that's one thing, but if you don't accept jurisdiction on the European Court of Justice or free movement and so on, then you cannot have a European economic area relationship with the EU, you can't remain within the single market which is the second set of flags. If you don't want free movement uh, and uh, you don't want financial autonomy, uh, don't want to make a financial contribution or have regulatory autonomy, you can't have a deal like the Swiss, uh, which is a member of EFTA but not a member of the EEA, for those who like uh, alphabeti spaghetti. Um, if you won't accept the idea of the European Court of Justice having jurisdiction, over your agreement, you want some other mechanism, and you want to preserve your regulatory autonomy, you cannot have a deal like Ukraine. And if you want to be outside the customs union, because Turkey has a customs union with the EU, you can't have the deal that Turkey has. So that means your options are, you have a deal that looks like a Canadian deal, uh, or a deal like Korea, or no deal, and you trade on WTO terms with the EU. The UK, is going to have to decide whether it wants to stay down the bottom where the tick box is or whether it wants to move back up the steps. Our Brexit debate, and this is going to really depress you, the Brexit debate is only in the foothills of the UK's debate about the UK's future relationship with the EU. Right? Everybody now needs a drink. So, an agreement's been reached between the EU and the UK, despite those red lines. So in that sense, uh, I mean, m one might view it as a remarkable achievement. But we have these obstacles uh, to seeing that agreement uh, in place. And one of those, uh, and uh, uh, let's say the real sticking point is, is Parliament, uh, the UK Parliament. Because of course, <laughs> Theresa May faces uh, a problem as Prime Minister, being Prime Minister, um, but not necessarily, not necessarily exercising the power that we've traditionally associated uh, with that role uh, because of the position of her party uh, and uh, her relationship with her cabinet and with her parliamentary uh, party. And the really interesting thing for us uh, who are concerned about Brexit is can Theresa May get her deal, get the withdrawal agreement through Parliament? Is this possible? Is this a viable proposition? Well, when you had the so-called meaningful vote a couple of weeks ago, there were 118 rebels in the Conservative Party. That's an extraordinary number of 
uh, politicians to rebel uh, against their party. But the good news was Theresa May got 202 votes in favour. The bad news is most of those are on the government payroll. They're ministers, uh, junior ministers, um, or uh, one or two Labour defectors. But things may not be as bad as they appear. Because if you look at, and this is, this is some work that BBC researchers have done, the hardcore of declared no dealers, no deal in any scenario, are relatively small. The significant group are the end backstoppers and the better dealers. That is the group that Theresa May is trying to win over at the moment, because that's the group that might move. Possibly also those who favour a second referendum or other alternatives, in other words, Remainer Tories. She might be able to win those over for uh, the withdrawal agreement. But that is a very, very steep hill to climb. Uh, and we'll have a better sense in a few hours, actually, as to how Parliament uh, stacks up uh, in some voting. Now, we do have an opposition party <laughs> uh, in the UK, uh, led by uh, Jeremy uh, Corbyn. Uh, and uh, the job of an opposition, of course, is in our system, as we conceive it, is to oppose the government. Uh, and for Jeremy Corbyn, he campaigned for Remain, sort of, uh, but we know that he is uh, a lever, really, truly. Cut him down the middle, and I think we've probably got leave written through the middle. But Jeremy Corbyn, uh, as leader of the official opposition, leads a party of which, with which he's out of step. Uh, and he has contorted himself across time to try and keep, on the one hand, the uh, predilection he has for leaving the EU but also, crucially and importantly, for keeping Labour constituencies that voted leave on side, and at the same time, wanting to offer a vision of Brexit which is different from the vision uh, offered uh, by uh, the government. Uh, but the Labour Party, in and of itself, doesn't have the ability to bring about the form of Brexit that it wants unless there's a general election, which is what their primary uh, focus is uh, at the moment, and the Labour Party's policy at the moment is not, although that may change in a matter of hours, uh, to support uh, the idea uh, of a second referendum. So actually what the Labour Party does is also of interest to us. Um, there are a relatively small number of Labour MPs who are committed to seeing Brexit happen. There are a substantial proportion of Labour MPs who would like to see uh, a second uh, a referendum. But there are an awful lot that go with the leadership, the Labour leadership. In other words, they haven't formally come out and said either that they or voted with Theresa May. And therefore, to see the withdrawal deal go through, it is possible to see some members of the Labour Party who may defect and vote uh, with uh, the Tories, possibly uh, as, as many as 20. Um, but we'll have, to, we'll have to wait and see. But at this moment in time, there is not a majority within the Parliamentary Labour Party for the idea of a second referendum. So for those of you here who may be UK nationals who favour the idea of a people's vote, sir, um, it is not yet apparent that the numbers stack up within Parliament uh, for that. So what about the public? Yeah, because ultimately uh, it's the public that keeps uh, politicians in power. Where is public opinion at the moment? Well, it's worth thinking about British public opinion on the EU, which is basically Britons haven't necessarily wanted to leave, but they haven't liked the EU they're a part of, right? I mean, that's been, that's been the British uh, attitude, and you could see that reflected across time. That actually, leaving the EU has been a minority interest in terms of public opinion. Um, but if you break down the Leave vote, what's very clear is that the Leave vote was constituted in a very particular way. The Leave vote was constituted, uh, well, certainly there was a preponderance of Leavers who were older than younger. There was also absolutely crucially a preponderance of Leavers who have lower levels of educational attainment. There's also a preponderance of Leavers uh, who had lower incomes, 
who don't own their own home. In other words, people who, it might be said, less, have less of a stake. Has their stake in the country increased since the Brexit referendum? Uh, arguably not, although rates of employment have gone up, wage rates have gone up, and so on. Home ownership has gone backwards. So if you look at public opinion on having a second referendum, what you see is this is a poll of polls, then actually remaining within the European Union has remained just about ahead across time uh, since March of last year. But there is still a significant, significant body of support for leave, which puts you within the era of, uh, of error in terms of polling. In other words, there is not some great stampede on the part of the British public uh, towards the idea of remaining within uh, the European Union. Rather, people have, have pretty much held their positions from the vote, uh, except on the margin. More interestingly is what people say um, when they're asked about uh, the deal or the choices. Do they want Theresa May's deal or something else? The caveat to all of this is that uh, only about one in ten people understand what Theresa May's deal is. So you have to take this, you have to take this slide with a, with a, with a cellar of salt. Um, but it's clear that if the choice is between the proposed deal uh, and some of the other alternatives, Theresa May's deal is just about a nose hair ahead, I would suggest, but not, not much more. So there aren't dramatic things happening within the public. Now, there is also, of course, what I would call the two-union problem. That for the UK, it has its problem with the European Union, but it has its problem as a union of the United Kingdom, which was very clearly demonstrated during uh, the referendum uh, where you had quite differential uh, voting patterns within Scotland and Northern Ireland from what you had uh, within England. That problem has not gone away. Uh, and that problem has not gone away because the Scottish Government uh, is committed to either remaining or ideally it would prefer to stay within the single market. Uh, ditto uh, with the administration uh, in Wales. We don't currently have a administration in Northern Ireland. Um, well, we do, but indirectly, and the DUP is part of the party that's supporting the government in power. Um, so that problem has not gone away and is likely to become more acute uh, as, uh, we, uh, as we get on. And back to Article 50, remember, the clock doesn't stop. You know, there are only now 59 days between uh, the UK, uh, between now and when the UK leaves, the, I just did this for time zone, by the way, uh, when, the, uh, when the UK is due to leave uh, on the basis of a no deal if no deal is in place. And so arguably the most important actor in this end game is the Speaker of Parliament, Mr Burko, who will decide very shortly as to which amendments which have been put forward uh, to, uh, to the government's uh, response to Parliament uh, on the meaningful vote, uh, where we'll see a possible vote on whether you should extend the Article 50 process by allowing time in Parliament to do so, and or whether the government should go back uh, to uh, Brussels um, and try and renegotiate uh, the, the backstop uh, agreement with Northern Ireland. So the next 24 hours is going to be even more Brexity exciting uh, than, than the, the last few weeks have got. So, Brexiting, thank you. I'll take a note of that. You didn't trademark it. Uh, so, what do I think might happen? Uh, I think probably the sensible thing to do is to stop the clock, to give the UK uh, a longer period of time to uh, complete uh, its approval of the withdrawal agreement, but the UK would have to persuade the EU there are good reasons for doing so, and all member states would have to be persuaded, if that's the case. I still wouldn't discount the possibility of the orderly Brexit, that uh, Theresa May manages to get her agreement through, but it will be uh, very tight. But we cannot rule out the possibility of no deal uh, happening, uh, I would suggest.
Now, what does all of that mean for New Zealand? This is my final few minutes. Uh, bearing in mind there's so much other uncertainty, I don't want to pile on to the uncertainty on top of that. Well, it's straightforward in the sense that if the UK signs up to the withdrawal agreement, there's what I would call a smooth glide path, which is essentially dealing with the UK uh, in, uh, in economic terms uh, remains as it was until 2020 or, or 2022, because the withdrawal agreement will be in place, the transition period's in place, and all the agreements that currently exist through the EU that govern trade between uh, the, the UK uh, and uh, New Zealand, all of those remain uh, unadjusted. However, the UK will also embark on its future trading relationship with the, with the EU. And as you've seen from those red lines, the UK intends to leave the customs union and intends to leave the single market. So one has to think about if making an investment decision at the moment, whether you want to wait and see and have clarity about whether investing in the UK is a good stepping stone or gateway to being uh, within uh, the single, uh, single market. But there is also the dislocation scenario, of course, which is we have a no deal Brexit, that the, not, is, not only is Britain preoccupied with, with managing that, but also it will immediately depart the customs union, the single market, and the EU's regulatory order, which means there are much more, a greater degree of uncertainty um, if you look at the UK as uh, a destination that you are using to loop back through into the EU market. It's also possible that there'll be travel and other dislocation uh, if you have a new deal. So if you're planning a holiday uh, to the UK uh, in late March, uh, don't plan to go to France for a day trip. Um, but also, um, I mean, it ends the, the, the arrangement that's currently in place between the UK and New Zealand, but because you have a forward-thinking government here uh, and a well-organised civil service, there are already a whole series of bilateral measures which have been put in place to facilitate the continuation of trade between uh, New Zealand uh, and the UK, uh, even with uh, that uh, no deal uh, Brexit. It's not to say there wouldn't necessarily be uh, dislocation, but I think reasonable measures uh, have been taken. Of course, in the longer term, uh, there is a question about how the agreement that New Zealand is embarked on negotiating with the EU then relates to the relationship that the UK has with the EU and therefore how it impinges on the relationship that the UK and New Zealand want to strike with each other. In other words, these are interlinked uh, and uh, one will have to consider uh, how they fit together if the UK, and it's quite possible, you could have New Zealand strike a deal with the UK that is more advanced or more developed than the deal that the UK has with the EU. That's not impossible um, in, uh, in a no-deal scenario. And there are broader foreign policy challenges uh, that we might want to think about in terms of how New Zealand uh, views uh, the UK and how the UK has a different approach towards immigration as well as security and defence and so on and so on, which are wonderful areas to speculate about. But at the moment, I tend to live on a 24-hour cycle. Uh, when I'm thinking uh, about issues uh, Brexit. So I'd love to hear uh, your comments. If you're too shy to talk now, you can always tweet me and I'll be happy to, to answer your questions. So thank you very much.